I'm excited to announce that our InfoSec Skills platform will be releasing a new challenge every month with three hands-on labs to put your cyber skills to the test. In September, you'll start in our Security Plus lab, exploring the ins and outs of secure and insecure protocols. Level two, move on to explore secure coding errors commonly found in JavaScript. And if you make it that far, it's level three, boss round, deploying advanced techniques leveraged by Sandworm APT to compromise, pivot from, and destroy a server. Complete all three challenges, download your certificate of completion, upload it to LinkedIn, and tag InfoSec for your chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card, an InfoSec hoodie, a one-year subscription to InfoSec skills so you can keep on learning, and a whole lot of bragging rights with your friends. Just go to infosecinstitute.com slash challenge and show us what you can do. Today on CyberWork, my guest is 22-year-old CEO Connor Gregg. You heard that right. Connor was recruited by HP at age 17 to be an applications engineer, worked for the British government soon after, and started Creator Sphere at the age of 22. He also recently saved McDonald's Corporation from what could have been a massive data breach. Find out how it all went down today on CyberWork. Welcome to this week's episode of the CyberWork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, and offer tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. Connor Gregg's career in IT started at age 17 when he joined Hewlett Packard as an applications engineer, but after just a few weeks was promoted to project manager. He went on to work on secure projects for the British government and was a project manager for secure cloud computing and software development modernization during the WannaCry Spectre and Meltdown vulnerabilities when those were found. Connor has already accomplished a lot in his new career, so we're going to talk about his cybersecurity journey, uh, the ups and downs of running his own startup, Creator Space, and uh, as a proud member of the LGBTQ plus community, the ways in which cybersecurity industry can more actively recruit, promote, and support professionals uh, from the community. Uh, also, if you're not uh, closely following cybersecurity news in England, you may have missed Connor's moment in the media spotlight uh, when he spotted that a contest from McDonald's that he won inadvertently sent their database credentials out in the prize email. Uh, so we're going to talk about his uh, journey through this surprising news story and the ramifications as well. Connor, thanks very much for joining to me, me today. Welcome to CyberWork. Thanks, Chris. I really appreciate it. Uh, so we always like to start um, by getting the story of our guests' cybersecurity journey in their own words. Uh, so for certain, years must have started quite early. So what were your earliest memories of being uh, drawn into um, the presence of computers and other tech and, and what sort of brought you uh, to the belief that that's something you wanted to do with your life? Yeah, I think so. It was a little bit weird for me because um, I grew up in a household that didn't really have computers or internet until okay. quite late on. Um, and when we did, it was really old age computers. So it was like Windows 95, um, you know, old cathode ray tube kind of desktop. Old so that, kind that of was computer. old. So what was what was what was new at the time? Because uh, uh, I mean, old for me is Commodore 64. So uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so like back then, IBM ThinkPad laptops were all the rage. Got it. Um, and they were, you know, you, you could get a, a laptop. I mean, it was still the size of a of a small house, but uh, right. I mean, we're talking yeah. like I guess two thousand and seven, eight, or uh, maybe two thousand and six. Um, so I was about seven or eight at the time, and I think the um, the first kind of thing that drew me in about it was just I think it was the creativity side of it because you know with computers you get um, you get kind of free reign, and I think I just didn't remember the first application I probably ever used was something like Paint, like you know every sure. kid does and. And you draw lines and you you fill it in with with colors and mm -hmm. uh, you make a little Picasso. Uh, at least I like to think it's Picasso. But yep. um, that's when I learned the importance of saving um, documents. Uh, right, <laughs> right. I, I didn't know that was a thing. Um, but yeah, and then, you know, as time went on with computers, and the reason why I think I got, you know, semi-decent, I like to think, at it, was because I found myself, because we didn't have internet. So the computer had yep. you know, maybe three or four applications. Microsoft Office was on it. There's nothing really to do with it. Um, so I found myself typing verbatim, word for word, uh, the line of which in the wardrobe in the right text oh. font in, in, in Word documents. Yep. Um, and that's how I learned how to type properly. Because at oh. school at the time, they weren't really teaching computers. And then eventually, as time got on a little bit and I got a little bit older, maybe a year or two later after I, I did that, I was, you know, way ahead of everybody else when it comes to typing. That's when I really started to like computers. 
Love it. Yeah. I, I'm I, the, the older I get, the more I think that my typing class in high school may have been the most valuable thing that they ever taught me. Um, so, yeah, so you, you said a little bit about it. what were some of the first things you started to do once you had access to computers? So you said the painting program, um, when did you sort of like break into, uh, sort of finding more unconventional uses for your computer, uh, apart from, um, you know, using it as a word processor, like you say. Yeah, so um, my uncle, he he worked in IT and he still works in IT. So I eventually got an um, IBM ThinkPad. It was back when IBM actually made them. It wasn't Lenovo and it mm-hmm. had the little dot in the middle. And that's right. when I started to do some fun stuff. It was XP, so it was still a while ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's when I got internet access. And I found myself going out and, and you know, watching all, I can't remember what hacker movies it would have been, but it would have been some hacker movie somewhere. <laughs> everyone Sneakers. says, yeah, yeah, everyone, yeah, exactly. And I was, I was, you know, trying to work out, you know, how to hack things, sitting in command prompts, changing the color of it, that mm-hmm. kind of thing. But um, as time got on a little bit more in school is when I kind of found the first unconventional use. And it was, it was merely by accident. Um, I found myself in middle school, um, about maybe 11 years old. And saving a word document you know i learned how to save at this point so saving a word document <laughs> and suddenly have access to the whole domain um of, of users so i could see everyone's documents um including nice. teachers um well yeah not so nice well, um <laughs> so I, anyway. I, took, I took it upon myself back then to to leave a message on some of my fellow students um desktop uh, it wasn't anything inappropriate like that, but um, the school didn't take lightly to it, but I admitted to it. That was the, uh, that's the way I always like to look at it, is I actually told them. I think, um, so I got banned for a year from touching mm. computers. I wasn't allowed to be in the vicinity of a computer. Um, even at home? Was, yeah, even at home. That, that was part oh. of the agreement was that wow. um, the, the school took it way too serious. Um, but I think it's because like, there was the first incident of that ever happening for them because really... Yeah. There's they probably really, didn't know what to do because there's no precedent for it. So Yeah, so and obviously communication... Away. Communication between head teacher and IT staff, you know, there's one man in a cupboard somewhere was the IT staff. So the, the <laughs> communication breakdown was like, I'd done something miraculously amazing, but really it was just a permission error somewhere. Um, so I got banned for a year. I couldn't touch computers at home. I couldn't touch computers in school. In fact, whenever I had like a substitute teacher, I'd have to openly kind of inform them as the lesson begins. I'm not allowed to touch computers, wow. uh, which was really a weird experience. So I spent a year, I think that's when the it, it got interesting was for a whole year, I, I couldn't use them so i was thinking of more and more ways yeah um to, to use them so yeah that's like kind of my what first was your yeah, what, was, what was your year off like then what, what, what were you doing were you reading books about computers were you were you still scheming or did you like really just like stop thinking about them for a year and then come back to it and if so did that sort of deepen your obsession yeah i think so i did i've never read on computers in my whole life that's the hmm. that's the weird bit about my education is that it seems quite natural for me yeah, so i've never read anything doing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I spent a year off, which obviously is not great when it comes to learning by doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, what 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 I did in that year was I would find myself often things would break in the classroom and everybody else wasn't computer literate. So the teacher would be like stood there confused on what to do. So I'd be like, oh yeah, you know, you can fix it this way, but I wouldn't be allowed to touch it myself. So I was finding ways to kind of do kind of level one tech support, age 11, 12. Um, in school without being able to touch it. So I was seeing kind of issues and I was paying more attention to how things break. Um, but, you know, I spent probably that that whole year just focusing actually on school and doing schoolwork, but more and more kind of getting jealous and annoyed that I couldn't use a computer. And, and when that year ended, I kind of made a promise to myself, which is like, I'm going to understand everything about computers. I want to know everything about how they work, uh, why we have them, how they started, everything possible. Um, so yeah, it was kind of a good thing because, you know, when you get taken away from something that you love and, and yeah. you can't use it for a year, it makes you really want it. Absence did make the heart grow fonder. And in this yeah, case, exactly. it started. Uh, so, so it's not that many years from that. It's, you know, five years later, uh, tell me about being scouted by Hewlett Packard to be an applications engineer at age 17. Like, what were you studying at the time and what were you doing that attracted their attention? Yeah. Um, so I was in the first year of sixth form. So in the UK, we have two years before you go to university, which technically right. you've ended high school and you can go to a college or you can continue that within the high school. They call that a sixth form. Gotcha. Um, so I was in sixth form. So I was studying to go to um, Cambridge University, um, not studying IT actually. 
to go and study law. And I'd spent a summer school there where I was doing um, law for, I think it was about two weeks. And I was completely set. I'm going to go to university. I, you know, I was doing double business and double IT, which was a bit unconventional because schools usually make you pick one, um, four different subjects. But I had convinced my school that these were the two things that I wanted to focus my life on. So let me do double business. So I got four qualifications, um, completely unique ones, but was doing double. So I was doing all that. And then around about um, the end of the first year of sixth form, as you're preparing to do your exams, um, Hewlett Packard, I can't quite remember how it exactly happened, but there was an email that had popped up um, with a job opportunity for apprentices at Hewlett Packard. And I was like, okay, that seems interesting. Um, so I was asked to apply. So I went and applied for it. Um, I, they offered to interview me. So I went in and interviewed. It was my first ever interview. I'd never been in an interview in my life. I don't even think I'd done interview practice at this point. Wow. So I rocked up. There was, I was the youngest there um, mm-hmm. in the interview. Everyone else was like 19, 20, 21. Um, I went in, I sat down and I got quizzed on kind of everything you can think about. So it was a very generic interview um on purpose because they want to see what your strong points were. And right. they were asking, you know, what languages do you develop? And at that point in time, I didn't develop in any languages at all. Oh, actually. really? So my answer was none. But you know, I'm sure if I gave it a shot, I could work it out. Um, and I think there was about maybe 30, 40 people there for that assessment day. And it went on for about six weeks, maybe eight weeks afterwards. I didn't hear anything. I just assumed, you know, I I absolutely bottled it. But um no, I then I got offered the job. So I, I got invited back. Um, they said, you know, can you start next week? So I was in school the Friday and they want me to start on the Tuesday or Wednesday. So I had like five days of, you know, if not in five days, four days of having to get used to the fact that I'm a child in school to an adult earning an adult wage at 17. Wow. I joined and 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 to be honest with you, I wasn't surprised because obviously I'd seen who'd interviewed, but I was the youngest there. In fact, I was the youngest in my age in the whole country and potentially the world at Hewlett Packard for a very small period wow. when I worked there. And um, I got assigned to the UK government. Did you uh, now? Uh, I, I want to definitely go to that. But um, what do you have a sense of what it was that they they saw in you at at, at that age, or what you what you provided that that uh, none of the uh, the older kids uh, were able to uh, provide? Did they tell you that at all? Yeah. So I actually asked, you know, why me? Because I think that's mm-hmm. always something people ask. You know, why why did you pick me out? Um, and one of the feedback was that my way of thinking and articulating um, kind of solutions to problems, because they do a lot of problem-based questioning and scenario-based, was probably the best they had seen. And they couldn't mm. turn that down because a lot of what yes. Hewlett Packard does, Hewlett Packard Enterprise does, is, is problem solving. Organizations come to us and they say, um, we need we have to solve this problem, but we don't know how to do it. And we need somebody like you to do it. So they needed people that were able to take something with absolutely no guidance and come up with a solution. And that was that was one of the reasons. The other reason was that when they looked at my age, but all my qualifications, that was something they took a lot of interest in. Was that my kind of study route was very IT focused, mm. so they knew it was kind of I kind of lived in and breathed IT. That was well, the other side your, of it. What was your study route like? What what did you show them in terms of how you would learn things? Was it was it mostly self directed, or were you taking computer classes in like like sixth form and everything? Yeah, so it was it was double IT and double business in sixth form and. Mm. Um, I was I was showing them the modules I'd already done, and we already had at that time presumptive grades. So they were saying, "This is because I'd already done my assessment. This is what we think you're going to end up with." So I showed them that, and they were asking, "You know, how did you find that?" Um, and I explained to them, "You know, it's great. I love it. I enjoy it a lot." And with that, I think they saw because the whole idea of how apprenticeships work in the UK they're kind of government sponsored, so mm. the government create a framework for apprentices. Um, and you can fit into different frameworks and have to apply for funding, lots of other things. But part of it is continuing education. So they pay for more qualifications. That's part of the, the whole deal. So you actually have to learn more. So what they want to see was somebody who was passionate about learning, but also knew enough to work the job. And that was that was an important thing to have. Yeah. Now, um, what were your responsibilities uh, initially at HP? Uh, so initially, I, I started out in what they call change management. So um, bit of an idle function. The role was looking after cloud changes. So um, it was assessing them, um, how they would impact um, our private cloud that we ran for the British government, mm. what that would look like. It was more of an administrative role with a bit of technical knowledge. A lot of the team were not technical. So when there was stuff that 
um, the kind of non-technical team didn't understand, I would often jump in and try and kind of provide some feedback. But what I noticed about that team is it's a very rigid way of working. So it didn't work out too great for me because the team were very focused on passing the stuff to another team when it was technical oh. and letting them deal with it because they were worried about liability and worried about me, you know, Sorry. saying saying I know the answer to something when maybe I don't because I'm the 17-year-old kid. <laughs> um, but what happened that was really good was that we had some project managers who were really quite terrible at making sure that changes were scheduled on time, you know, typical mm. project managers. Yeah. And they were really bad at kind of keeping track when stuff was supposed to be done. So instead I got assigned to them um, mm. and my job was to create their changes, make sure they get approved, chase them and it was kind of like you know you don't fit very well with this team this isn't technically too much of a technical role but you can still advise technically so i did that and that's how i got in with project managers so i got in with gotcha. the program manager the project managers and you know as the time went on they basically said would you like to be a project manager and you know at 17 you say yeah sure sure i had no idea what a project manager did but yeah especially I'll, since I'll you it. saw people doing it poorly and you're like i i literally know what not to do so yeah no i i was like you know i i don't necessarily know exactly what they do but i kind of know because i'm walking around with them all day yes. so i was like yeah I'll, I'll give that a shot and it really it started out covering so whenever mm. a project manager would go on a holiday or if a project manager was ill i would still oh, take over the change you're the substitute kind of... teacher yes exactly <laughs> um now um tell me about uh working for for the government from there how did the because you said that hp uh was working you know with with the british government whatever whatever how did was that the, the project management part of it or was that something completely different so what happened was hp had a contract to deliver um quite a few services to uh, the department for working pensions it's an employment agency in the uk and what happened towards the end of that contract is the british government decided they were no longer going to outsource it so a decision happened where Hewlett Packard were to transfer some staff into the British government and work directly for them. And the idea behind that was that uh, you would take all the knowledge from Hewlett Packard and be able to run it in-house inside the government. So I transferred to the British government around about, I think it was about 2019, maybe, maybe okay. earlier than that, 2018. Um, and my job there when I got there was very similar to the old change management stuff I was doing. And that lasted maybe mm. six weeks because I hated it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and towards the end of the six weeks of that, there was like, uh, I remember this guy, um, and his name is, and he, he, um, was basically trying to fight about 600 different fires on, on his own, uh, and trying to solve so many problems on his own with hardly any funding. And what those problems were, were we've left Hewlett Packard, but we still heavily depend on them for a lot of the functions that these teams do. And we somehow have to get those functions into the British government and do it in a way where we don't have any downtime, we don't affect any customers, and we do it very quickly with no budget. And doing that sounds fantastic. It's, oh yeah, that sounds like a great challenge. Um, until you understand the scale of the, the fact that the British government, the department I worked in, had 80,000 employees that used the mm -hmm. systems every day and 63.6 .6 million citizens that were depending on us. So that's how I got into project management again in the government was I am... Um, I said to Andy, uh, you know, I used to be a project manager. I mean, I'm not anymore into <laughs> change management. And he said, why did you never tell me this? Um, <laughs> and it, it was that day that I was elected project manager for, um, okay. for modernizing software development life cycle was the kind of the end of it. But the very beginning, it was in-housing and transforming um, our secure development life cycle in cloud. I, I, I like all these stories specifically because we get so many comments from people who are just starting their cybersecurity journey and not really uh, knowing how to sort of get a foothold in. And it seems like your story is, is such a combo of um, something opened up and I went for it, even though I don't necessarily have all the qualifications and also um, just being sort of fast on your feet and and saying like, all right, I can learn, I can learn this quickly. Um, I, I'm willing to pivot to a new thing, thing like that. And I think that's, those are like really good lessons to learn in terms of, um, like making a, making a mark for yourself. So not saying like, well, I'd love to do project management, but I'm, I'm the change management guy. There's nothing I can do, you know, and stuff like that. So, um, so I hope people are, are listening closely to this story. <laughs> I think one of the really important things that I learned very quickly at HP was that if you didn't shout and you didn't make a, a bit of a bother about something, it was never going to change. Right. Um, and that that applies to your role, which is uh, I had somebody that I worked with. I won't say her name, but she was she wanted to become a project manager. She'd worked in change management for about five or six years at this point and had never got anywhere. And I turned up, you know, eight weeks or whatever it was later, become a project manager from the team that she leads. And I can see her 
you know, how infuriated she was by that, because that's not a nice thing to be part of. At the same time, if you don't kick up a fuss because she hadn't said anything to anyone, she may have mentioned it in, you know, performance reviews, but hmm. we all know how they go. They get forgotten. Oh, so yeah. she was never kind of trying to kick up a fuss or network. Um, and my thing was really about, you know, being nice to people and saying, hi, I'm Cotter, you know, when I'm being introduced and, and taking note of what they do in the organization. You yep. know, people get big job titles sometimes, but little responsibility. You want to look for the people that you see doing stuff. They're the yes. ones, you know, ones that are always walking around kind of with their, their shirt rolled up and they're walking around and they're, they're not necessarily shouting at people, but they're trying to work out what's went wrong. They're the ones to get in with because they're nice. the ones that the, the organization depends on. You become friends with them. You'll find your, your way very easily. Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna make you're gonna sort of uh, you can get into their 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 tailwind of their current things like that that they're doing things. Uh, so, what exactly is your area of specialty in cybersecurity? I know your your degree is in ICT systems. Um, is that an area of cybersecurity you still work in real uh, regularly? And I know now that you're a you're a CEO, uh, you run your own company and stuff. Like, what what do you like doing? You've done project management, you've done change management, you've done other things. Um, like, what are you? Do you find yourself good at? What do you like doing? And what types of work would you still like to be doing as much as possible. Yeah. So my specialty um, is is quite weird. Um, so social engineering I, is something I take a lot of pride in being mm -hmm. quite good at, but um, it's kind of prevention uh, is really what I specialize in. And what I mean by that is people develop things all day and they do really great things. Um, but sometimes they don't see the risks that's associated with that. So I'm really good at spotting out, you know, factors that could potentially result in a breach or or something like that. So it's assessing problems that haven't actually occurred yet. Um, and you get a lot of kind of cyber risk and compliance people yeah. in organizations, and they're great again, but they don't often have a technical background. I was one of very few project managers that actually had a full technical background, could, mm -hmm. you know, could do a lot of things when it comes to computers. I wasn't a business mm -hmm. guy. So I'm really good at spotting when somebody says, oh, I'm doing this thing with this database and doing it this way. I'm able to quite quickly go, yeah, that's not going to go well, and here's why. Mm -hmm. So my my area especially is prevention of, of breaches or, or attacks or, or that kind of thing and spotting risks very easily. Um, but I do enjoy on the side social engineering, a little bit of red team. And you know, okay. I, 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 I dabble in everything, but um, yeah. certainly prevention is my specialty, is, is that blue team kind of stuff. Gotcha. Now, uh, as someone who who runs their own company and has has uh, you know probably some degree of managerial responsibilities, do you ever have a hard time balancing getting to do the stuff you want to do versus doing the stuff you have to do? And oh, I'd love to be doing that, but I got to deal with payroll right now, or I got to hire seven new people, or, or things like that. Do you you know do you ever sort of wish that you can sort of like step backwards and sort of get your hands dirty more often, or do you or have you found a balance in that? So in Creatosphere, we're really lucky. We're, we're not too huge of a team. Um, okay. we're, we're quite new. So um, we've only been around since March, April of this year. Um, officially, the mid-April is when we started actually working on the project. Um, in that time, we, we've done huge things and we've worked with some great people and we have some great people inside of our organization. With that, I still get day-to-day -day, uh, the opportunity to sit. We have a virtual office. I get the opportunity to sit down with the people that are doing the stuff that I want to do that maybe day-to-day -day that I don't get to do, which is the security stuff or maybe you know getting a little bit involved in the development stuff. Um, I think one of the things is that you are right. When you get into a managerial role and you progress through an organization, you'll find yourself doing less and less and more kind of talking and more meetings. What's important is you don't forget the stuff that you used to do hands-on. As soon as you forget that stuff, then you actually make yourself vulnerable. And I don't just mean from a security perspective. I just mean from a development perspective. If I forgot yeah. how long it took to develop something and you know somebody says to me it's going to take six years, if I don't know that that's a ridiculous overestimation, I might say yes and allow it to happen. Right. Um, so part of it is, you know, yes, you don't get necessarily do the stuff day to day, but what you really get to do is mentor people inside the organization. I've had many a conversation with people that work with us um, uh, about, you know, random stuff about the threats that printers produce from working from home and, and stuff like that. And, and just random conversations that went on for, you know, two or three hours after work's finished. And what you see is coming out is the next day you see in your cyber briefing, uh, the threat printers have on the organization and, mm -hmm. and the ways to prevent it. So, you know, you don't necessarily get to do the stuff every single day. You don't get to get hands on, but you actually get to impact it. And it's really important. If you yeah. become a manager or go in and manage your role and you're not impacting, you're not seeing the stuff that you're talking about in your reports or, you know, in the stuff that people are producing, then you're not doing it right. So you have to keep some hands on. Often I do side projects. Yeah. 
Um, that are personal projects that I get to play around with, like, you know, cloud environments and security groups. Because if I did it inside the organization, I'd get shouted at. So I don't <laughs> I do not do it inside the organization. I'd get told off. So I do my little side game servers or whatever. And I, I learn kind of the different things. And I go, you know, could we maybe try and do this for the organization? Then I go and let the actual, the real people go and do it. Uh, and I just sit and watch and, in, in, you know, in, all, in the background. So your job is cybersecurity and your hobby is cybersecurity. <laughs> that helps too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I like to play around with stuff. But the, the really great thing that we have is that um, as an organization, because we're basically a tech company, we don't we don't really provide anything that other than tech. Um, we are very heavily tech people. Everyone that works for us loves tech, is involved in tech. Yeah, sure. um, so we all have our little passions and really our organization is quite different because instead of us saying, this is your job and this is what you'll do every day, what we do is say, here's a task, who wants it, right? right. Um, and, and we let people kind of step up. Now, obviously, there's some times where you, you can't let somebody do something because, you know, somebody else has to do it. But in most cases, we're able to say, yes, your job tells this, but if you want to do this, go ahead. So, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes I find myself writing stuff for cybersecurity. Sometimes I, I find myself decommissioning users. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes I find myself responding. Last night, we had a, an outage and um, I got called in to help fix it. And that happened the other week. So, you know, yeah. I do find myself getting involved sometimes, but, you know, most of the time I get told off and, and told not to touch it. <laughs> I was going to say, I think people like the idea of the CEO having to get the mop out and actually <laughs> clean the halls, but it, it, not not always. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so before we continue to talk about careers and and your, your company and such, I want to hear more about the McDonald's story. So I've read several accounts of the story, but for our listeners who are just hearing about it now walk us through what happened what you saw and what happened when you reported it so uh, i don't eat mcdonald's a lot i know my figure may say otherwise but i don't i promise um i the other day me and my partner we decided we were going to get mcdonald's delivered to home and we thought there's the monopoly promotion on so we'll order a load of food and we'll collect all the tokens and it was just a bit of a laugh it was just a bit of distressing and i went we had some of the food. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't eat most of it. Mm-hmm. I just had the token. So I was going through and, and going through the boris process of typing the codes into the claims form. And I typed them in and, and won things. Uh, and one of the things that I won was a comedy subscription, which is great because I love comedy. Mm-hmm. One of like, you know, one of my little things that I watch. And I went to go and look at the email. And because I'm so heavily connected, you know, having an Apple Watch and having my iPhone, I, my emails are instantaneous i can't live without them and i spotted the the top bit of the email just past the subject and it started with data and i was like that's a bit peculiar i thought oh it it might be just some html classes so i clicked on it and then immediately at the top of the body of the email just below the the just above the claim information was the staging and production credentials to mcdonald's monopolies databases in the uk (laughs) um with with the connection strings intact so you know sending the username and passwords is bad enough But also the location of the databases and the database name made it almost to the point where it was like, this is ridiculous. (laughs) Um, So I I was like, oh, crap. It's like they just threw the doors wide open. Yeah. I was like, oh, crap. Uh, you know, <laughs> McDonald's is, is relentless for, for, for being quite heavy handed when it comes to lawyers. Mm-hmm. So, um, the first thing I did, I think it was within three minutes of receiving that I'd emailed their support email. I tried to call them, but it was, a, I think it was a Saturday or a Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, and I couldn't get through to anybody cause they finished work an hour before or something that I'd claimed the ticket. And I was like, really? Okay. So I thought I'd give corporate a call. Cause usually there's already somebody in and I rang the U S corporate office and got hit with a, a, not even a voicemail, just an answering machine that just said, we're all working from home don't call us basically. Oh my and God. And hung up. And at that point, kind of social engineering kicked in and, and like, you know, somebody must have leaked their phone number somewhere. So I was, I managed to find a list of phone numbers for senior vice presidents inside of the organization. I rang every single one of them, including their cell phone and got no wow. answer. Oh my God. About gosh. 18 people. So at yeah. that point, I, I, at that point I, I thought, okay, this is getting a bit ridiculous now. Cause now it, it looks, it looks like I'm either not trying to contact them <laughs> or, or I'm like trying to hold them oh, ransom. Exactly. So I, yeah. 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 <laughs> at that point, I, I turned to social media. So we have a TikTok account, which sometimes does really well um, in terms of content. So I posted on our Creative Sphere TikTok account and said, um, 
McDonald's have given me the, the keys to the kingdom. And I really missed out on a pun because I should have said the keys to the golden arches, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> right, right. Uh, the keys to the kingdom. And I screenshot the email. <laughs> yeah. I screenshot the email and I, I censored out the, the important stuff in the email and said, you know, does anybody have an email address that I can email this to? I tried LinkedIn because I thought, you know, that's where everyone is. They all had their profiles on private, so I couldn't get through to them on LinkedIn. <laughs> and I thought, you know, for a company that has just sent me um, the login details for their databases, they have privacy of their employees They're really. Astonishingly uh, secure in other, way, in other ways. <laughs> exa- exactly. Um, and, and some anonymous user um, message our, our account and give us an email address for the UK cybersecurity response team. Mm. So I emailed them and that was that. And the next day, I, you know, I worked most of the US time. So I was asleep when, when I got the confirmation email that they had acknowledged it. Um, but in the email, they'd sent two. So they'd sent me one email saying, can you give us some more information? But they'd also sent an email to their suppliers saying, we've received a suspicious email. We think we're under attack. And then try to recall the same email because they weren't supposed to send it to me. Uh-huh. They copied me in the email by accident. So I already knew at that point I was dealing with maybe a team that doesn't necessarily deal with breaches a lot and, and is mostly outsourced because I looked at the company. So I, I reached out to the, um, the cybersecurity manager. I gave him a call because he said he couldn't get in touch with me. So I called him and I explained to him on, on the phone kind of what had happened and the steps. And the first thing he asked me was, were you doing SQL injection testing? I said, no, I was Generally, the end user usage of your site. It, <laughs> that's the worrying email. part. Yeah. That is the worrying part. I didn't try to make this happen. Uh, and I said to him, you know, if you had a build bounty program, I, I, I would have reported it for the right methods. He said, yeah, no, um, Global won't let us have one. Um, oh. And I, I said, yeah. oh, okay, right. Um, <laughs> so how do you want me to send you this email? And he said, could you forward it to me? I said, I can't send you live credentials over email because I don't know if you sent them to me and you're the insider. For, I, d- I didn't quite know what to do. So yeah. I said, is, is, can you give me a PGP key and I'll encrypt it at least? He said, no, I'll send you a SharePoint link. So I <laughs> I uploaded it to SharePoint and and I never heard back. Um, I, okay. I, gave him a, I gave him a call an hour or two later and said, you know, did you get it? And he said, yes. It's just we're dealing with another thing right now. It's also really bad. And I was like, oh, okay, um, I'll let you go. Okay. And then that was it. Um, that was it. Nothing had happened. And yep. it was... Okay. And then I, I did notice when I reported to them that somebody else on Twitter um, around about the same time as me also received an email. They'd posted on Twitter, said, you know, you should contact them and see if their experience is any different. And then about a day or two later, the register reached out and said, you know, um, Troy Hunt's posted about this. Um, you seem to be the original reporter. Can we can we speak to you about it? I said, well, yeah, I, I don't mind. And I told them kind of similar to what I told you. Um, but I kept getting asked by the reporters and everybody involved, you know, did you did you try and log in? I said, no, of course I didn't try and log oh in. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said, he said to me, he went, he went good. Cause if you'd said yes, I would have to delete this recording. I went, no, I did not try and log in. I am, I'm not that stupid. Oh, no. but what I did see though, is that McDonald's in their statement, uh, and you, you might have to fact check me on this cause I might get it wrong, but McDonald's in their statement acknowledged that the staging database credentials were shared. Um, but when they were reached back out by the register, when they said, well, it was also production, they refused to comment on, mm. on that. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I know that somebody else has confirmed the staging credentials were correct, and it was the same username and password for production. The only difference was the database name and the, the location. Mm-hmm. So my assumption is potentially that may have also been exposed, and that is an assumption. I, I can't confirm or deny it. Um, okay. So, yeah, that was my experience. McDonald's Monopoly for you. Yeah. Now, uh, it doesn't. I, I feel like I've, I've already got the answer to this question, but um, do you think they took swift enough or appropriate action after after it was made apparent to them? Do you do you know what what sort of happened apart from okay, thank you, uh, goodbye? Uh, what they did if they if they plug whatever leak that was or whatever mistake it was or you know whatever uh, problem and. Uh, you know, I guess it's worth asking what would what could have happened if someone less honest than you had seen the credentials first and decided to act on them. Yeah, so I think the the first thing is that in terms of response, it was a bit peculiar because originally what it looked like was that it was some sort of debug output that had happened. Hmm. Later on, the reporter that I spoke to from the register and actually some other screenshots I've been provided by other people, it actually looks like we all received the exact same string, but it was at different times on different days which Mm. would suggest it was actually embedded in the email manually by, you know, somebody accidentally pasting it there uh, or some script at some point failing when it was generating the template. So this whole time, it wasn't actually a real time output. It was an output from a different day with different claim codes in it that somehow managed to find itself in every single template email uh, that was coming out for that that redemption. So I think saying swift enough response would be very um, untrue because really, I, I <laughs> yeah. mean, from what I've seen is actually, it, it was actually probably sent to customers that weren't as tech savvy 
from maybe the Friday onward. And they didn't acknowledge it um, publicly until the end of Monday, I think, or maybe Tuesday. I spoke to them privately about midday on Monday. Um, but at that point, what I'd, what I'd really realized was that they were quite unprepared, which is a bit worrying because early in the year, McDonald's had a data breach. I think it was the US or, or another franchise area, but they had a breach. So you would think something somewhere, there was some preparation that could have been done. Um, and it seemed that really what they were depending on was their their MSP, their provider, to do mm. it all for them. Um, don't get me wrong. The gentleman I spoke to on the phone sounded very qualified, but he also sounded like this was maybe the first or second time this has ever happened for yeah. him, which is obviously very difficult because, you know, yeah. we have major incidents that aren't security incidents, you know, when a server goes down. And because we happens regularly, you know, when, you know, something gets misconfigured, we're, we're so used to it that when your phone goes off, it's like, yeah, you know, it, it's bad, but you don't feel kind of nervous or scared. Yeah. It sounded like he was maybe nervous or scared because it was, you know, good. It was the first or second time it had happened, yeah. but also bad because the practice wasn't there. So the a large, response, yeah. probably not. Opening a door in your house and finding a large portion of your house is on fire is a little cause for concern. So, yeah. And then the other side of it, which was, you know, if somebody was a bad actor, and that's what I was really worried about, mm. was mm-hmm. um, obviously there's the McMillions documentary that was on, I think it was HBO in the US. Mm-hmm. The documentary goes into how, you know, for five or six or whatever years, there was fraudulent claims on the winnings. My brain initially kicked in, which was if somebody's tech savvy enough to know what this is, but is also malicious enough to sell it, I can't confirm whether production credentials work or the staging ones because I hadn't used them. But right. what I do know is that the connection, the, the database URL does definitely work because it's an Azure database. So mm. I, I knew that straight away. So if that was misconfigured and was internet facing, somebody could log in and because of what was in the email content, it would suggest that all the unclaimed and claimed codes existed in there, their status, so whether they are wins or not, and what they win. So I'm malicious enough, you know, with two seconds on Heidi SQL or whatever could change the outcome of the game, which mm. made me incredibly worried because I didn't want to be blamed for that. That's yeah, why I was so sure. eager to tell them that I had it and it wasn't me. Because <laughs> yeah. I didn't, that's not the that's not the conversation I wanted with McDonald's lawyers. Um, no. was that, you know, so that's a that, very, that's the worrying thing. That's a very weird place to be in where you're trying to sort of like help them, but know that if you don't do it exactly right, like you become sort of public enemy number one. Yeah. And, and McDonald's in, in, in their defense and also against them are very, very good with lawyers. Mm-hmm. It's kind of, you know, first hand they are burger chain, second hand they are a law firm, basically. Right, right. Um, and, and I really did not want the cost of that lawsuit um, on my hands. And that was right. the really worry thing, which was like, you know, it may have only been sent to 10 people. It could be sent to thousands of people, but only maybe one or two techies have seen it. You know, it's a huge promotion. They have millions of prizes and, Considering that everybody often wins at least one small, you know, not so great prize. Right. um, It would suggest that tens of millions play this and, you know, um, are are spending money on the promotion. What does anger me slightly is that the statement that they've made to the um, computer kind of journals and, and, and websites and gazettes they haven't actually publicly stated anything on their public channels to consumers. So as IT techies, we know what's happened, but they've not actually said, by the way, we did accidentally send credentials. Mm -hmm. They maybe were or were not publicly facing or or whatever. um, And we're sorry about that. Really what they've said in their, their statement was they would contact all the people affected. But what I can say is although when I've contacted them, I've not been called back to say, by the way, um, you know, it was or wasn't real or, or it was a test or, you know, right. I, 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 I mean, if it was a test, it was a very poorly performed test, but whatever it was, you know, it was a case of we've patched it now. We're so sorry. Not, not even really as much as a thank you. Yeah. Um, or a free doing pie. It, which is, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, <laughs> McDonald's black card is, is something I, I take up. Um, I don't eat there a lot, but it'd be nice to have something to say. <laughs> I, feel like thank you. Most, I feel like that was the most um, uh, poorly recorded part of the, the article that I read where it said that you were a, a regular consumer of McDonald's. And <laughs> so, Meaty produce. Yeah. I know. And then I, now I'm hearing, Gareth, you know, like, Gareth wait, did a, wait, wait a minute, that doesn't add up. So. <laughs> no, I know I am not. I, I don't eat there regularly. Um, it's one of those things that was like, um, I, I, he's playing fun at me because because I said that and he wrote that in there, but it was to get me back for saying that. 
But yeah. yeah, it's it's one of those things which is a bit of saying because it's really important for organizations. We have a bug bounty in Creatosphere. I saw one of the comments on the article was like Creatosphere doesn't have a security XT, so they can't say anything about McDonald's not having one. Mm. Um, which frustrated me slightly because our security TXT, we don't have one, but it redirects to our bug bounty. Uh, in fact, if you go to Creatosphere and type forward slash security, it redirects to the bug bounty page. Um, the reason why we do that is because sending us stuff via email is fantastic, but we want to do it in a way that we can acknowledge it properly, triage it properly, and, and treat it as an actual incident. And if we're doing that as a startup, you know, that isn't funded, we're 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 bootstrapping and working with an accelerator. If we're doing that, why can't a multinational, huge organization do it? And in their defense, yeah. the US counterparts do have a security TXT. The problem is it's only for the US site. Got so it. If you're in the UK, you get redirected to the UK site and there is no way to get that security TXT unless you push for it. And even then it's going to go to the wrong people. So Wow. Interesting. So um, let's let's talk about uh, your company. Uh, Creator Sphere, is it? Yeah. Creator Sphere. Uh, what what made you decide to start your own company and and like what need did you see that needed satisfying? I know you mentioned similar creator patron support portals like Patreon and OnlyFans. How does how does Creator Sphere different differ from those? Yeah, great question. So Creatosphere started, um, I was conversing. So I, like I said, I'm on TikTok, um, maybe a little bit too much than, than I should be. Um, <laughs> and and back when Creatosphere started, I found myself in this limbo of, I didn't know what to do career-wise. I had done a little bit of consulting after I left government. I was now in the position where we're still in the pandemic, but we're coming out of it slightly. Cases are dropping, testing is increasing. And I was like, you know, I don't know quite what to do. Um, and I was in a conversation with my friend who's a TikTok creator. And we were talking, um, he's got a decently sized audience and we were talking about kind of, you know, why this platform's not very good and the over moderation here and the, and the, um, wave approach and creators here. It's like talking to a brick wall. Uh, and I've experienced that myself on, on TikTok are, are really bad for over moderation, but I guess it's probably better to over moderate than under moderate. Um, yeah. but he was telling me about, you know, Patreon's fees were, were quite, you know, high for what they okay. provide they provide a great service only fans is very adult driven there's nothing wrong with that um we have a adult platform that's similar to create so we were like you know all these problems i was like oh i could solve that and that you know famous last words i should never have said that but <laughs> i can i can solve that and originally we were going to create this small tech based um platform that was going to just allow people to subscribe to tech creators and that was it it was going to be a little side project i was going to go out and go and do my other jobs or you know go do something else but i got to speaking to more creators not just tech creators and they were telling me about well yes you know when i want to work with brands i have to go and screenshot all my analytics and it takes you know weeks to hear from them sometimes they never get back to me i get really bad brand deals that are like you know we'll pay you six thousand dollars to say that this new energy drink um is great but it might also cause cancer you know all this stuff and you're like wow, this is pretty brutal. And I got another person telling me, yeah, it, my videos do great on TikTok, but I just can't survive because, you know, I might have a million subscribers on or followers on TikTok and my videos might get tens of millions of views, but I get a hundred dollars payout from it. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's crazy. You know, on YouTube, you, you get, I think it's a 60, 40 split. So 40 goes to YouTube. And sometimes you, you can, you can get a decent income, but it's not often sustainable. So we're like, wow, this is a plethora of problems. And we actually, we were speaking with, an investment partner today, they said, why are you trying to solve all these problems in one go? And, and the simplicity is because is nobody else is doing it. So what we do is we, we provide a platform that links together four key components. The first component is analytics. So we help creators get all the analytics from Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitch, TikTok, and we put it all in one place and mm -hmm. we help them understand it. So we say your audience on Twitter is mostly female, 16 to 24. On YouTube, it's male. Their interests are this. And what we're doing is we're helping creators understand who they should be directing their content to. Okay. And it, it's often like you're shooting out into the, the wild and some people will watch some videos and some people won't watch the others. What we're really trying to do is help them and say, here's what your audience looks like. Here's what they like. Here's mm. what they don't like. Here's when they're online. So here's when they like your stuff. Here's when they're not online, don't post them. And um, we're doing that by one, analyzing their data, but also all the other creators' data. And we're using AI machine learning to give actionable suggestions to them on how okay. to improve. And it's about one of the things we often see creators doing is they'll create content and then they'll create different content, which is completely different to that, to try and get into a new segment, but right. they often lose their original subscribers. What we're mm -hmm. trying to do is let them do both, keep their original content viewers whilst also growing at the same time. That's a hard thing to do as a creator. So okay. that's the first thing we do. Mm -hmm. The second thing we do is membership management, very similar to Patreon okay. uh, and very similar to OnlyFans and very similar to those kind of platforms where you that's pay X amount. You pay X yep. amount each month and in return, the creator gives you this. 
Um, that's because creators are, you know, it, the barrier of entry to be created today is a mobile phone. So there is thousands and hundreds and millions of creators that are currently unable to do their passion, which is being a content creator and producing good content, you know, documentarians, for example, because the money from it isn't enough. You know, when you're posting one video every two months, because it's a high quality in-depth documentary exploring X, Y, Z, the advertising revenue from that one video doesn't sustain you for that two or three months of researching and producing that content. So you need to find a way that the people who enjoy it can still have the stuff you produce whilst also sustaining an income. And that's where the membership tiers come in. It's not a case of just getting more money from your followers. It's often for people that produce really, really good content that need to find a way to sustain that and make it a living. So that's the second thing we provide. Okay. The third, the third thing that we do, which is a little bit different, um, is e-commerce. So we give creators a way to create an e-commerce store in roughly about ten minutes, and then from that we produce their their products for them, and we get it shipped to wherever their their fans are. But we do it in a way where they don't need a manager and they don't need a graphic designer. So we work with partners like Fiverr, for example, and we put them through to Fiverr. They'll find a designer on there that's helping a small business on Fiverr. They'll design the stuff. They'll upload it to Creatorsphere, and when somebody buys it. We will print it, pack it, ship it, and deliver it to the customer on their behalf. We will deal with the returns and we'll deal with all the finances. And the last thing which really gets everybody going is the brand deals bit. Mm. So Creatosphere um, is, is fantastic in, in two ways. The first way is brands love us because what we do is let them get directly in touch with creators and do their pitches through our platform. And they love that because it's a lot cheaper than using a management agency and it's a lot quicker. And then for creators, they love it because they're getting a better deal often because they're, you know, the amount that you give to a social media management company is huge. Often that gets tacked on with the amount that the creator gets. So they get a lot more money through us. The second thing of why they love it is because it gives them opportunity to quickly reject and accept offers which we can take the time that usually takes six to eight, sometimes 12 weeks and bring that down to two weeks from Mm. idea pitch all the way to production and and getting it delivered. And creators love that because what we're really doing is removing those huge barriers of entry. And the end of the day, one of the things we always say is we're just helping creators tap into revenue that is sat right in front of them. And we're doing it in a way that we're not gobbling all the money up like a manager or or a management company. We're doing it in a way that we, we make a decent, you know, we're not a charity, we make a profit from it, but we do it in a way that's sustainable. So the creator enjoys it and it also provides a decent beneficial service to everybody involved. Okay. Now, um, do you have any sort of advice for people who might be wanting to start their own companies? Any any pitfalls that you you had in in doing this? Because the, the the how how old is 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 Creator Sphere as a company? Is it a year old? Two years old? No, Creator Sphere has been around for six months. Six um, months. Okay. Six months. Yeah. 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 It's wild. Um, and you're and so, you're and you're twenty two, twenty three. You say? I'm twenty two. Yeah. 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 So you you started you started early. You got it going. Um, any anything that you uh, could advise people that don't do what I did or do what I did or anything like that? Yeah. I, I, so uh, f- well, we're actually making a, a small documentary. And um, one of the oh. things we always said is that um, in the event that we um we fail or we succeed no matter what we're making a documentary on, on what happened that goes through kind of how it all started and and, mm-hmm. and stuff but my my top advice um is one find people that you love working with mm-hmm. um so the, the guys that i work with the guys and girls i work with they're fantastic um they are passionate about what we're doing and you know because we're a startup and we're self-funded and, and as much as we're working with an accelerator we're not backed by any vcs at the moment we're doing this all out of our own pocket a lot of our staff work for what we call equity. So they're getting shares in the company and they're not substantial. They're substantial that they're worth something, but they're not substantial to the point where they own 50% of the company. You know, it's a right. very small number. A lot of them are doing this on their spare time and producing mm-hmm. work for us because they're truly passionate about what we're doing. So yep. find people you love working with because otherwise it'll be awful. You know, when we mm-hmm. first started, we probably hired some people that probably wasn't the best decision for us longer term. And those people are no longer with us. Now where we are at with our staff team, we're able to have candid conversations a bit like what me and you are having right now. And we're able to talk about, you know, when we think something's been done right or, you know, when we think things aren't progressing quick enough, we can actually sit down and just converse normally like friends. Um, the other thing is, is don't be scared to be remote. Uh, I know that sounds like something most organizations, you know, wouldn't care about. But in a startup, one of the things we always get asked by anybody that we talk to in terms of investment, they always say, and you're all remote and they kind of look at you a bit funny and they say, is that because of the pandemic or do you plan to keep it that way? And we say, well, we plan to keep it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what I mean is my two co-founders, Scott and Cody, they're in the US. So they weren't there day one. I founded it on my own. They came in roughly about day 10 and worked their way up to co-founder and have helped you know, enormously since then Mm -hmm. they're in the U S and I'm in the UK. So don't be scared to be remote. 
find the best people you can. And actually being remote can often mean that you can find better people. So that's, that's my second piece of advice. The third thing is don't rush into getting an investor. You don't need hundreds of thousands of dollars to get your idea off the ground. You just need to know the right people to talk to. And that can often mean, you know, searching for emails. We, we've worked with AWS and Google Cloud and lots of other cloud providers, and they've helped us out enormously, giving us credits, huge amounts of credits, not just the normal public amount, um, to help us sustain this vision without us paying for hosting. So find people like that. Find vendors that are happy to help you. Don't yep. go for the small mom and pops because their margins are a lot slimmer. Go for the big organizations. They are likely going to throw you twenty to $30,000 your way in credit. Keep that, use it, build your platform on that. There you, go. Don't, you don't need cash to do it. Create a sphere, tries and finds any open source um, solution to any paid product. So we use mostly open source solutions inside of our organization. And then customer facing, we try and use as much open source tools as possible. One, it has great security benefits because it's able to be audited a lot easier. Yep. And the other side of it is that because it's open source, we're getting continuous improvement and development from the community. Mm -hmm. And we mm -hmm. can also contribute back our part of that into that open source development and let other people use it. So that's my free top tips. Keep it cheap. Thanks. Find great people and, and don't be scared to be remote. You, you don't need an investor straight away. Investment awesome. comes naturally. Good, good, good stuff. Uh, good concrete stuff here. So uh, turning from that, um, you know, you've talked about your your love of cybersecurity and how when you're not doing cybersecurity, you're doing cybersecurity and with a side of cybersecurity and so forth. What are your preferred methods of learning new concepts or skills? For someone who might be homebound or for a bit longer right now, what, what tips do you have for kickstarting your cybersecurity knowledge? Yeah, great question. I think there's a YouTube channel called, I think it's called Fireship, um, mm -hmm. and they do a, a explainer videos in 100 seconds. And it's not actually 100 seconds. So they'll explain what the concept is in 100 seconds, and then afterwards they'll do an interview with an industry expert on it, and they'll go into it. So you can watch the first 100 seconds, then then jump off it. Find channels like that, which will explain concepts very quickly, because then you can go, oh, yeah, I do have an interest in that, or I don't. The worst thing you can do is go down a rabbit hole of learning something at the end of it, go, yeah, no, I really hate that. You know, like when it comes <laughs> yeah, to right. mind, like, like Cisco um, switching and routing comes to mind, like going down the rabbit hole of that, getting into it and going, wow, I really hate this. But now I'm so, <laughs> yeah. I'm so far stuck in it. I'm studying it for you know the CCNA or whatever. I'm studying it. I've paid mm -hmm. for the books. So find explainer videos for free on YouTube that explain the concept of what you're trying to do. They might not educate you on it. You might not know it or learn it from it, but you'll know if it's something you're interested in. That's really, really important. The second thing is that once you've got those videos and you know you're interested, don't immediately go out and buy all the books. Don't, don't do that. Okay. Don't immediately go and schedule an exam and then work up to it. Right. Um, certifications, you know, I've hired people of the year. Certifications look good, but they're not the be all and end all. And what we often find people doing is if you just study for the certification and continuously learn from that, that's often more powerful than the certification itself. If go. I can see how you're applying it, that's important. So you don't always have to go and pay for a certification. But if you do, make sure that when you're paying for it, that you're paying for it so far out in advance that you're able to actually learn. And if you get stuck on something that, that you know, you haven't got two weeks until you're going to do the exam, it gives yeah. you enough time to learn it. Because the worst thing you can do is just skim over something because you're stuck on it. Don't do that. You right. have to, if you don't understand that one word or that one sentence or that one chapter, you need to go and eat, live, breathe it, please. Yes. Because yes. you don't do that. It's going to be the one thing probably in your career somebody asks you about, and then you're going to go, oh yeah, I don't know that bit. Right. Or the example will probably ask you it. I've had that before where 100%. you know I, I've got stuck on something. I've got to go and do my certification. And then the exam, literally most of the exam is on that one chapter. Yeah. And you're Question like Question one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So so if you don't understand something, you're not stupid. That's that's not what it is. There isn't any stupid questions, but use the internet. You know, Stack Overflow is great. You know, server fault's really great. Reddit's good. Hacker news from Y Combinator is really good. Go out and find the information. Get yourself in Discord servers. There's lots of Discord communities out there for cybersecurity. Yep. Uh, Marcus Hutchinson's Discord server comes to mind. Um, there's loads of other ones as well, like Tech Talk. Um, it's a, about 6,000 um, community members. I used to be an admin there. It's great. You can literally ask any technology question from security all the way to hardware to electrical engineering. They will have an answer for you or somebody will try and help you. Find communities like that so that you can understand. That's one of the best learning techniques I've seen. The amount of people that have come through a Discord server that I've spoken to that have found a new passion and then went and got qualified in it is, is ridiculous. So yeah. that's one of my best learning methods. Love and then, it. you know, get, get yourself and look for startups. I know it's not necessarily the most glamorous of things, and, you know, some startups have ridiculous requirements where they're going to ask you to, 
you know, work weekends and every single day of your life for the next 16 years and pay you nothing. Don't go for those ones. Mm -hmm. But find ones where you can work on the weekend and you can provide a little bit of knowledge. What you're going to find is other people that are really passionate about what you want to do in there. And yes, you might not get be getting paid. You might be getting equity or it could even be a volunteer role. But if you get involved in that, you can do it from home. You can do it on a laptop. You can often do it on a phone, a lot of this stuff. And it gets you at least involved in talking to people. It's all about knowing right. people. And you're I doing real work too. Yeah. Yeah, real concrete stuff. Um, so um, to pivot a, a little little further here, because um, I think it's important that LGBTQ plus awareness in cybersecurity should go beyond one month of the year. Obviously, Pride has come and gone now, but I wanted to talk to you about your experience uh, as a gay man in the cybersecurity space. Have you met resistance or had setbacks as a result? And do you see friction in the hiring or promoting process where LGBTQ plus people are involved? Yeah, I think well, I think diversity as a whole uh, is important. Um, that goes with age, gender, sexuality. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I know that if we just talk about age, when I joined HP, as great as HP are as an organization, there were still people that had been doing it for 50 years that thought I was completely no use to them because I was so young. And right. that, that's, that, that's pretty brutal. I can't say that I've had the same because of being a gay man. That's not, that's not so. But what I have noticed is that sometimes people can be a bit too shy when it comes to the subject. So I was, I remember talking to some of the um, team when I was in government and uh, I can't remember what it was, but eventually I, I was like, oh yeah, and, you know, my partner or whatever. And obviously he's a man. And I said that and they completely like shut down because mm. they didn't know if they should, you know, engage with it or not. And right. my, my, my point is if you would do it for somebody that is in a relationship with a woman and they're a man, then you should do it for everybody else. Right. Yeah. You know, that's, that's the way it should be. Um, in terms of hiring people, I think the first and best thing that we are certainly trying to adopt in, in creators, for example, is get rid of names on CVs or resumes, mm -hmm. get rid of anything that indicates to age on CVs and resumes and try and get rid of any personal information on a resume so that when you are assessing that person, you are purely assessing them on their skills and ability. If you can do that as an organization, what you'll often see is you'll get so much more of a diverse culture. You'll get better talent because you're not being prejudiced and you're not looking at someone's name and trying to assess where they're from or if they're male or female. Right. And what you'll also get from it is naturally as an organization, you'll mature and develop. I've seen it in different organizations and it has such a positive effect. So I would say for hiring managers out there and, and people like that, it's really important to just get rid of the stuff you don't need. When you're assessing a candidate, you're assessing them for their suitability of the role, their sexuality, their gender, their national origin, their age does not play into that. You're assessing purely on ability. Okay, so to go from the other side of that, from a, from a hiring standpoint to a, a culture standpoint, can you uh, come up with any suggestions for, uh, you know, because as you said, you have a situation where you said, you know, my partner and your your your, your fellow people, uh, employees shut down or what have you. Do you have any suggestions for making cybersecurity or tech culture more welcoming to uh, people of diverse backgrounds? Uh, you know, because obviously that's that's one of those things that's, going to change over time, but you know, maybe that's not, it's, it's not okay to just let it happen. It needs to happen a little faster here. Do you, do you have any suggestions in that regard? Yeah, I think don't be scared to show that you're diverse, but also be cautious. You know, we have greenwashing when it comes to eco stuff, be, be mm -hmm. cautious of diversity washing. Um, yep. we, we get organizations that will plaster diversity everywhere, whether it's sexuality or national origin or whatever, they'll plaster everywhere. And then when you get in the organization, you can take a look around and, and see that's not maybe they just grouped people together in a room yep. for it. So be cautious um, of, of how you go about it. But I think what's really important is there's like networks like um, in the UK government, the Department for Convention, has thing called DWP Pride. It's an um, organization inside the organization that looks out for LGBTQ plus employees. Mm -hmm. And it's not just for LGBT, uh, LGBTQ plus employees. It's for all employees to be part of. And the idea behind it is that it's an ally organization. Mm -hmm. Think about stuff like that. If you join one of those, you don't have to be a gay man. You don't have to be trans. You can be anybody. That's that's the part of it. And you're showing your support. Um, I think another thing which is really important, and I, I'm going to get a bit personal with this one, Please. which is organizations um, should try and have a presence at all different types of events. Pride's one of them. Mm -hmm. Women in tech, for example, they should try and have a presence at all of these. Make an effort. Even if you're not going to pay for a banner, you're not going to pay for a stand, just buy a ticket and send one of your colleagues there to talk about your enterprise because it's just a small act like that that can really make a difference 
One of the things I've noticed, which was in the UK this year of coronavirus, there's a, a decently large festival called Manchester Pride. Mm-hmm. And they cancelled the Pride Parade and they only did the music event. And that infuriated a lot of people, including me. That kind of stuff is where we start to kind of diversity wash and we pretend to be something that we're not. Right. So try and get in with Pride Parades, try and get in women in tech, try and look at it as an organisation, ways that you can be better and kind of reach out. It doesn't have to be about, you know, whether someone's black or white, whether they're gay, lesbian. It doesn't matter about any of that stuff. Just try and be a better organization. And internally, if you feel like you're not making an effort personally as a human being and your organization doesn't have a pride or or whatever inside of it, be the first person to start it. You don't have to be gay to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so as we wrap up today, thank you very much for your time. I, I know I'm, I'm we're running a little long here, but I appreciate you taking uh, so much time with me here. But as we wrap up, can you give any advice for our listeners who might be considering cybersecurity as a career uh, and who are just getting started but feeling a little intimidated by the possibilities? It's never too late. That's the first piece of advice. Mm-hmm. I've seen many, many people come into organizations at all ages. It's never too late. The second thing is that if you are in IT right now and you want to switch to cybersecurity, Great, you've already got your foot in the door. Try and work out a way to come pally with them. You can offer suggestions. You can offer feedback. You can even be involved in some of the pen testing, some of the kind of social engineering stuff. Kind of be cautious of, you know, um, risks in your organization. Report them. That is the best way to get in, which is you're kind of being very aware of the cybersecurity stance. If you're outside of an organization and you're trying to get into cybersecurity, either learning it or, or trying to get a role, in terms of learning, the internet is your best friend. Mm-hmm. Social media is your best friend. Discord's your best friend. There's loads of tools out there. Insect Institute has them as well, where you mm-hmm. can learn skills from them. And then if you've done all that and now you're trying to get a role, find a startup. I know I keep talking about startups, but I, you know, yeah. I, I love startup culture. <laughs> sure. Find a startup. They will take not everybody, but they will find anybody that has an interest in an area and they need yeah. to help with it. They'll find, find one of those. something for you to do. There's, there's, there's work for your hands to do. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. the other thing as well is that if you're looking at organizations like Accenture or HP and you want to get in there, look for educational outreach programs that they have. They often always do job fairs. Get your CV or your resume printed. Mm. Get it over to them at that job fair. Follow up with them. Network. Get business cards. Reach out to cybersecurity events. You know, a lot of them, if you email them and say, hey, I'm a student, I don't really have the money to pay for the, you know, the £600 ticket, they'll often waive the fee and give you the ticket for free. So look for things like that. Just be kind of a hustler. Hustle as much as you can. There is no other way to do it. But if you want kind of an easy route in, find a startup, volunteer with them, or even if they're paying, take the really low pay because often we don't pay very well as startups. So take the really low pay, not until they've got investors anyway. Take the really low pay, get in there, make the organization as secure as possible from your expertise, and then use that on your CV. If you want to use that as a leapfrog, then go to the big boys or stick around. You'd actually be really surprised at the kind of stuff that you get to do in a startup you don't get to do elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. The being in that on the ground floor has uh, worked out for a lot of people. Uh, yeah. So one, one last question this is for all the beans. If our listeners want to learn more about counter Greg or creator sphere, uh, where should they go online? Promote whatever you want. <laughs> Yeah, so this is my, my time to plug more. So createsphere.co is a, is our website. We're createsphere co on all social media other than Facebook where it's createsphere. If you're interested in working with us, um, get in touch with us through LinkedIn or our website. We have a live chat on there. Um, you can also email us. We're often always advertising roles, internships and university placements is something we do a lot. We are very, very key on how we do that in terms of time. We're aware that you're a student and we're very flexible to the point where we don't set the amount of hours you have to do. So you can just come in whenever you want and pop your head in and kind of learn. The other thing as well in terms of what we're doing is keep an eye out for us on social media because we're often giving things away on there. Um, you know, sometimes gift vouchers, that kind of thing. Uh, and yeah, there'll be a documentary soon, sooner or later with, with okay. my face on it um, that All you guys right. will be able to watch. Well, we'll uh, we'll have you back on after the after the documentary has been done if you're interested. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to come back. Okay. Well, Connor, thank you so much for joining me today, and and best of luck on your bountiful security career. It's been so much fun. Thank you so much. Uh, and as always, thank you to everyone listening at home or at work or at work from home today. Uh, new episodes of the Cyberwork Podcast are available every Monday at 1 p.m. Central, both on video at our YouTube page and on audio wherever fine podcasts are downloaded. Mm-hmm.